All right, good afternoon. So while I'm filming this, this is Monday, so it's the Monday of break. Um, so we are on, I think, what, day six quarantine now since school and classes let out. So hopefully you all are enjoying your break. Um, I've been working on multiple things, so kind of unrelated to work. I've been working on trying different new recipes. So one recipe was a total and complete fail. There are probably the worst cupcakes that I've ever made in my entire life. Even my husband, who normally eats all sweets, decided they were disgusting, so they went straight in the garbage. Um, the other recipe was a success. So for the other recipe, I tried to make a cheesecake, and that turned out really well. So, you know, you win some, you lose some. Other fun things that we've been doing, um, I learned how to play poker, so my husband taught me how to do that. I'll insert a picture at the end of this lecture of the dog helping my husband play poker. Um, but other than that, most of my time has been spent trying to teach myself how to do online teaching. So right now, I think the most difficult aspect is that I'm so used to seeing all of you in person and actually teaching to someone, whereas right now, I am literally talking at a wall and talking at my computer, and for whatever reason, and the dog just doesn't want to stay in the room and listen to my lecture. You know, you'd think she'd get something out of this, but apparently she'd rather play poker than listen to a virology lecture. But anyways, I digress. So welcome back to day two of assembly, exit, and maturation. So when we last left off, we talked about how do we assemble the pieces of a virion and um, we kind of compared and contrasted a little bit, at least for sequen sequential capsid assembly and concerted assembly. We walked through a couple of examples. So today we're going to pick up with packaging. So we're going to think about this idea of how do we make sure that the correct nucleic acid is actually packaged into the virion. We kind of glazed over that as we were building our polio virus and building our flu virus last time that we met. Um, we're also going to talk more about acquisition of an envelope. So we kind of mentioned it for concerted assembly, but we're going to talk about, well, for herpes. We kind of stopped halfway through. We talked about how we made a procapsid, but we didn't talk about how it got out of the nucleus and where its envelope comes from. So we'll touch on that today as well. And then finally, we're going to talk about release. And again, we're going to compare naked and enveloped viruses and talk about their similarities and differences in terms of how they are released. So we're going to start with packaging. So as a whole, when we think about packaging, you can define packaging as putting viral nucleic acid into the capsid. And of course, when we put viral nucleic acid into the capsid, our goal is to not put the host nucleic acid. So in the case of retroviruses, this is a great example. Um, we know that for HIV, we talked about how that pseudodiploid genome has to get out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm since HIV goes through concerted um, assembly. Well, it turns out that that retroviral RNA is less than 1% of the host's entire cytoplasmic RNA. So our problem kind of becomes, well, how do we distinguish that? How do we make sure that that 99% of the other RNA that is in the cytoplasm, which is the host, that that doesn't get packaged and that the viral RNA does? Or in the case of DNA, even if you're in the nucleus, in the case of herpes virus, um, herpes virus has but one nucleic acid, and we have multiple pieces of nucleic acid because we have many chromosomes. So how do we make sure that the correct nucleic acid is packaged? So I'm gonna go ahead and encourage you to pause the video and to think about a possible solution and to do some brainstorming here. All right, so I hope that you have gone ahead and you've paused the video. And um, again, if we were in person, I would ask you what kind of things that you came up with. But hopefully some of the things that you brainstormed are some of the things that I'm going to tell you about. And the first thing that I'm going to say is a signal or tag. If you've taken cell biology with me, we always kind of make a joke that the answer to every question is some sort of tag or some sort of signal. And it turns out that that is the exact solution that we have to this problem. And what I mean by that is we're going to have typically two things. We're going to have specific sequences that are only present 
and you guessed it, in the viral nucleic acid, but not the host. So by having that specific sequence, that gives us something to recognize that is viral specific and not host specific. Um, so what are some of these types of signals? I'm gonna give you kind of broad examples and then on the next page here, we'll write down some specific examples. So that can be things like short repeats. Um, it can be things that are part of promoters or enhancers. So again, those sequences are going to be specific. Um, the other thing in terms of major solutions that we have is we can have viral proteins whose entire job is to interact with these signals. And so they'll recognize these specific sequences, um, be it that the repeats or part of the promoters or enhancers and they will interact with those and they're going to help bring that to wherever we're assembling and so if that's at the plasma membrane it's going to help make sure that that concerted assembly happens and that genome comes along so here on the next page i'm going to give you some specific examples so we're going to start with HIV and the reason for that is we kind of use it as an example for the fact that only 1% of the host cytoplasmic RNA is HIV. So we know that it has a dimer or it has that pseudo diploid genome and this is actually really important for packaging. So if you recall the genome kind of looks something like that. Um, and between where that pseudodiploid genome interacts, we have these loops and we have specific hairpins that occur. And those specific hairpins, those loops are going to kind of interact together. That's what makes that pseudodiploid dimer. And it's thought that this idea of having the pseudodiploid genome is what allows HIV, one of the proteins responsible, is a protein called GAG, and we'll see this again shortly, but that that is what helps GAG recognize it so that it makes sure that instead of grabbing a host RNA, the HIV RNA is grabbed. Another thing that we see in the case of herpes, so now a DNA virus example, is we have something called PAC1 and PAC2, these are really important um, sequences that are in the genome, and they're going to be really important for not only recognition of the herpes virus genome, but also when it comes to packaging, it's also important for cleavage. So if you recall when we talked about herpes virus replication, we said that it does rolling circle replication, and because of that rolling circle replication, it gets a really long concatamer of DNA, and as it's packaged, it's kind of chopped up. And so these PAC1 and PAC2 signals are going to be important for packaging, but also for cleavage. Another really great example of a virus that we talked about is SV40. So if you remember that LT antigen, it binds near the origin. So we actually have a sequence near the origin um, and there is a cell protein that is called SP1, which is a transcriptional regulator, and that binds to that specific sequence that is near the origin and near the enhancer, so kind of near that area where the, where the LT antigen binds. So the cell protein SB1 binds to it, which signals for a viral protein to bind to SP1. So another example that I can give you is for polio. Now, for this one, we don't have a packaging sequence, at least not one that has been found. So for the other um, examples that I've given you, I've said that there are specific sequences. It turns out for polio, 
We have not necessarily seen a package sequence yet. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, but right now we at least don't have any data that suggests that it has that. But what we do have data for is VPG. So if you recall, back to when we talked about polio RNA-directed RNA synthesis, we talked about VPG, which is a protein that um, is used at the beginning of the replication to make a short little primer that we can then use to take that positive RNA to negative RNA, back to positive RNA. And so one of the things that we've noticed is when you have VPG and you remove it, so without it, no packaging occurs. And so what we think is that VPG actually plays a role in packaging as well. So not only does it serve as a primer, but it also plays a role in packaging. Um, other things that I can tell you about packaging, and it's not the most perfect way to kind of put it into rules, if you will, but we can kind of group it into two main ways. And the first way is head full packaging. And the idea of head full packaging really just goes back to as it kind of sounds, you keep putting in nucleic acid until the head is full. And really great examples of this are many phages. Um, herpes is a really another great example of this. And for head full packaging, um, you typically have some sort of a portal protein at one of those five hold ends and there's a motor pump and you continue pumping in the nucleic acid until a certain pressure is reached. And in the case of herpes, we can actually kind of put it underneath both of the categories. So we have head full packaging and we have genome length. And for genome length, as that kind of implies, it's going to be a specific length. The viral proteins bring the genome to the capsid, and it's a specific length of genome. It doesn't vary between virions. Unlike head full packaging, which in some cases it can vary. So I'm actually going to put herpes underneath both. It's kind of a rare example because herpes not only does it have a specific genome length, so remember that we said it does rolling circle replication. We're going to use those PAC1 and PAC2 sites. Um, when we get to them, we're going to cleave them, and by the time you get to cleaving them, it turns out that that capsid is now head full as well. So herpes is kind of a weird example in that respect. There are other examples that kind of fall underneath both categories, but there are also examples, particularly in phage, where if you were to isolate the genome of multiple phages of the same kind, you'll actually see different, slight different amounts of genome and slight different starts and stops. And the reason for that is they just keep packaging until they're head full. So again, um, this is just kind of another way to think about packaging and another thing to think of as we're putting the pieces together. So, so far we've covered specific sequences that are present only in viral nucleic acid and not in the host. Um, we can have signals, or those signals can be short repeats, I should say, and we can also have viral proteins in the case of polio um, that are used as a signal, if you will, or you can have viral proteins that specifically bind that sequence and bring that nucleic acid to um, the virion. All right, so now that we've kind of discussed packaging, and again, we could have a lecture in and of itself on packaging, but we would be here for forever. So we're gonna kind of leave it at that. We're not gonna move on to where does the envelope come from. So we've actually already seen one place where the envelope comes from and hopefully right now you are shouting at the screen and you are telling me that one of the places is the plasma membrane. So in the case of HIV and flu, we drew that concerted assembly happening at the plasma membrane and that envelope came from there. But we can actually have other places where a membrane can come from. And that other is going to be our internal structures. And those internal structures can include things like the Golgi, 
the nucleus in the ER. And so we've already kind of mentioned that the endomembrane system plays a role in all of this, but we're going to talk more details about it. So the next question that I'm going to ask you to think about is, what do you think actually determines whether the virus gets the envelope from the plasma membrane or from an internal membrane. So I'm going to go ahead and have you pause the video and brainstorm some ideas. All right, so hopefully you've paused the video. And again, I kind of gave you a hint when I said we've talked a little bit about the endomembrane system. And part of it has to go back with this idea of, well, where are our proteins? So what kind of tag do we have on our proteins? So we might have a square tag that says go to the nucleus, Maybe we have a triangular tag that says go to the ER, and then maybe we have a star tag that says go to the Golgi. And so those glycoproteins and some of the other proteins that make up the structures in that plus or in the envelope of the virus, it's going to depend on where those proteins go. So if we have a protein that is supposed to go to the plasma membrane and the glycoproteins are all sticking in the plasma membrane, there's a good chance that you're going to be packaged at the plasma membrane. If those proteins are supposed to go back to the nucleus, then perhaps you get your envelope from the nucleus, so on and so forth. And so again, where those protein signals and where it is packaged is going to determine where the virus gets the envelope from. So we can summarize this by saying protein signals and where it is packaged. So typically, if it is a virus that is packaged in the cytoplasm, it's going to get its envelope from the plasma membrane. If it's a virus that is packaged in the nucleus, it's going to get its envelope from the nucleus, the ER, or the Golgi. Now again, there are exceptions to these. These are just generalities. All right, so kind of moving forward in terms of release, and the reason we're kind of introducing envelope and release together is you will see that these steps really kind of go together. So we're kind of introducing the concepts, building, and then we'll draw out our model viruses. So moving on to release, this step is going to depend on a couple different things. And that's really the structure of the virus. And so this comes down to, is the virus enveloped or is the virus a naked virus. And so for this step, we're actually going to be incorporating previous steps, depending on whether we had sequential or concerted assembly happen. So again, we're kind of continuing to build upon the previous steps that we've talked about. And before we get into specific viruses and drawing things out, we have to do a quick review on organelles and our vesicular transport. So we have mentioned this idea of the endomembrane system throughout this topic, both in day one and day two, but we have not yet drawn it out. So I'm gonna ask you to think back to Bio 185 and see if you can kind of pull the pieces together. So I'm gonna challenge you to pause the video and to try to draw a representative model of the endomembrane system, and then we'll come back and we'll draw one together. All right, 
So hopefully you have recalled some of the information from Bio 185. So I'm going to start on the left of this page and kind of work my way to the right. And I'm going to draw the main structures first, and then I'll draw the actual vesicular transport that occurs. So we're going to start with our nucleus. So again, our nucleus has a double membrane and that outer membrane of the nucleus is continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum. So here is our ER. The next thing that we have is we have the Golgi sacs. So we have the cis side of the Golgi, which is the closest to the ER, and then the trans side of the Golgi. And then last but not least, we have our plasma membrane. So I'm going to try to pick another color here that is very different that hopefully we'll be able to see. So we're going to start at the nucleus. So let's go ahead and say we have something that is being exported out of the nucleus. It's going to enter the ER that's going to be endocytosed. It's going to be passed through that endoplasmic reticulum and it will be exocytosed. So I'm going to go ahead and draw that vesicle here. So now it's been exocytosed. Now that vesicle is going to travel to the cis side of the Golgi it will be endocytosed, and then it will travel through the Golgi to the trans side of the Golgi, and as it's traveling through the Golgi, there may be modifications that happen, and then we're going to end up with a secretory vesicle. Let me redraw that secretory vesicle because it looks like a horrible secretory vesicle. That secretory vesicle is then going to interact with the plasma membrane, it's going to fuse at the plasma membrane and it will end up releasing its contents into the extracellular space. So again, the host normally does this and we're going to see how this applies to viruses. So how do viruses use the host endomembrane system? And even though here we've drawn a squiggle and maybe it's a protein that's being released extracellularly, um, we can actually apply this to things we've already seen. So in the case of flu and HIV, we talked about how those glycoproteins are inserted into the plasma membrane and then concerted assembly happens where those have been inserted. Even though we drew it very simply and we kind of just drew them hanging out in the cytoplasm and then boom, in the plasma membrane, they actually went through this endomembrane system. So one of the things that I challenge you to do is to go back to day one and to actually add that detail into our models that we have of those viruses. But for now, now that we have done a quick review of vesicular transport and the endomembrane system, we are going to go on to talking about how this is used by enveloped viruses. So again, I've mentioned this a couple of times, you're probably sick of me saying it, but the viruses that we have already covered that are enveloped are flu and HIV. So now what we're going to do is we are going to focus on herpes virus. So for herpes viruses, we have already talked about the first part of what happens. So just due to time and space, I'm going to just quickly summarize it, but not draw it. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to write nucleus here on the right. And at this point, we have talked about how our herpes virus has undergone sequential capsid assembly. So we have built a procapsid around the scaffolding proteins. We have pumped that head full and genome length DNA into the capsid. And we've done that by recognition of the PAC1 and PAC2 sites. We've chopped them at those sites as well to make sure that we get the correct genome length. And now we have a fully assembled nucleocapsid. But now that nucleocapsid capsid needs 
an envelope. So where is that going to come from? So we're going to go ahead and we're going to draw our nucleus and that nucleus is attached to the ER and I'm going to draw a couple less folds in my ER so that we can kind of see what is going on here and that herpes virus is going to get endocytosed into the ER. So let's go ahead and I'm going to try to draw this a little bit smaller. So here is our endocytosed herpes virus. As it travels through that ER, it's actually going to then get exocytosed. And the next step that it's going to go to is the Golgi. So I'm going to go ahead and just like I did with the ER, I'm going to draw a larger Golgi with less of the membranous sacs just to get the picture across. So here's our cis side of the Golgi and here's our trans side. So while this is happening, we also have the glycoproteins that are in the membrane of the virus being produced. And those glycoproteins using the endomembrane system have been signaled to go to the Golgi. So what we're gonna see happen is as our herpes virus gets endocytosed into the Golgi, we now end up with the herpes virus that has a membrane and it has its glycoproteins that it needs. Now at this point, we are actually going to exocytose from the Golgi. But when we exocytose from the Golgi, we're not going to have membrane fusion. So I'm going to try to draw these in two different colors so we can kind of see what's happening. So here is our nucleocapsid, our DNA, our membrane with our glycoproteins that came from the Golgi. And let's do dark blue for our membrane from the Golgi. So now at this point, we have a double membrane. And now that we have a double membrane, now we can head on over to the plasma membrane. And I'm going to kind of draw a couple steps ahead here. But that double membrane, that outside membrane that comes from the Golgi, is going to fuse with the plasma membrane. And when it does that, it releases a mature herpes virus virion. So let me jot some of these down. Let's go ahead and label our plasma membrane here. So let's go ahead and add that these are our herpes virus glycoproteins. So herpes virus is a great example of an enveloped virus whose envelope does not come from the plasma membrane. Its envelope actually comes from the Golgi. All right, so that's the example that we're going to talk about for enveloped viruses that use the endomembrane system specifically for the virus traveling through it and not just the viral proteins. And at the very end of this topic, we're going to do a compare and contrast, and I'll give you some other viruses that also use this method. But for now, this is the example that we're going to focus on. So the next thing that we have to talk about is what about our naked viruses? This is fine and dandy for those that have an envelope, but as we know, not all viruses have envelopes. So again, I'm going to challenge you to pause the video and to come up with ideas as to how naked viruses might be released. All right, so hopefully you have pause the video and you are back with some ideas.
So some of the ideas that I can share from students from last year, since you're not actually here to discuss with me, um, some ideas that students had was, well, maybe they get a membrane and then that membrane fuses with the plasma membrane. And so kind of like with herpes virus, where it gets an extra membrane and then that extra membrane goes away, maybe naked viruses get a membrane and then that fuses and then it's released naked. Um, maybe we just kind of blow up the cell and it turns out that that blowing up the, the cell or that lytic or lysing is what happens in many cases. So again, when we think about the fate of most host cells that are infected by a naked virus, it's usually death in one way or another. So oftentimes for naked viruses, they will lyse the cell and we will talk about that. So let's bullet point some ideas of how this can happen. So lysis can happen by apoptosis. So in the next topic, topic 11, we will actually talk about some of the ways that viruses control apoptosis. And for those of you that have taken cell biology with me, you actually already know the answer to that, and that is of her cell signaling. So we'll spend a lot of time talking about the different ways that viruses control cell signaling in a host. So we can have apoptosis. We can also have viral proteins that poke holes in membranes. And we call these viral proteins that poke holes in membranes, we call them viroporins. Um, in phage, we see something very similar. We see things called holins. And again, these are just viral proteins. They poke holes in the membrane. They basically help blow up the cell, lyse the cell, if you will, so that um, the virions can exit the cell. And although most happens by lytic, I will say that some non-lytic mechanisms also occur. And we'll talk a little bit about those at the very end. So let's talk about some lytic release and let's give you an example. So the first example that we are gonna talk about is adenovirus. Okay, so for adenovirus, we're actually gonna split this over two pages. On this first page, we're gonna draw the first half of the life cycle and then on the second page, we're gonna add the new pieces or this idea of lytic release. So we're gonna start with the very first step. So let's go ahead and draw our icosahedrocapsid. We'll draw some DNA and we'll draw the fibers that adenovirus has on those five fold, on those five folds. All right, let's go ahead and add our plasma membrane. So it is a naked virus, which means it's going to be endocytosed. So after adenovirus is endocytosed, we're going to have protons that are pumped into the endosome. That is going to drop the pH. As that pH drops, we're going to have the proteins kind of start falling apart. So I'm going to just, in the endosome, draw what's happening. So we're going to start to have some of those proteins fall apart. And as that happens, we have a protein on the inside of the capsid that because of that drop in pH is exposed, and that is going to poke holes in the endosomal membrane. Which, as this is happening, I'm going to draw our nucleus down here. 
as this is happening, that adenovirus that's in the endosome is being walked across on those microtubules with motor proteins towards the nucleus. And so by the time we get the holes in the endosome, we're going to be near the nucleus. And now we can have the adenovirus DNA be dropped off into the nucleus. So now we're going to start at on a new page and we're going to draw the next steps of what's going on in our nucleus. So let's go ahead and I'll be good this time and actually draw a nuclear pore here. So here's our nucleus and at this step of hers just like with herpes virus we are going to have some transcription that happens. So here's our mRNA. That's going to be shipped out. We're going to make some proteins. The proteins that we need, perhaps they're the proteins to build the capsids, the scaffolding proteins. So some of those proteins using those tags are going to be shipped back to the nucleus. At some point when we make uh, our polymerase and some of the other proteins that are needed. We are going to have replication and at this point we have enough proteins and enough nucleic acid that is copied that we're ready to assemble. So then we're going to go through the entire assembly of adenovirus and the assembly of adenovirus is very similar to herpes in that there is a procapsid that is made, and then we have a mature capsid. So we get that capsid expansion that happens. So I'm not gonna draw all of those pieces, but we are gonna go ahead and draw a nice assembled mature nucleocapsid. So now we've gone through all of those steps and we have mature assembled nucleocapsid. And one of the cool things that adenovirus does is it actually makes a viroporin. And the viroporin that it makes is called the adenovirus death protein. And that adenovirus death protein, and I'm actually going to go ahead and I, I like to think of it as a knife. So here's our adenovirus death protein. And what it does is it destroys membranes. So the reason that I drew it as a knife is because it literally cuts through membranes. So it's going to go ahead Let me let my writing catch up with my talking here. So it's going to go ahead and destroy those membranes, which is going to break up that nucleus. So I'm going to kind of draw a broken up nucleus here, which is going to allow the adenovirus to exit that part. Now, of course, this is going to continue as it gets to the plasma membrane. So we're going to have that death protein or that viroporin that's going to continue chopping up membranes that allows all of the adenovirus progeny to be released into the extracellular space and essentially allows the entire cycle to start all over again. So there are other examples of viruses that have viroporin viroporins. And um, at the end, again, when we do our compare and contrast, I'll introduce you to some of those and have you kind of put those pieces together outside of class. But I did want to walk through at least one example so that you can see how this happens. So again, for adenovirus, we have this adenovirus death protein, which is the viroporin that goes ahead and chops up those membranes that allows the adenovirus to get out of the cell.
Okay, so we've talked about an example of how lytic viruses exit. So adenovirus is a really great example. It's a common way that many naked viruses exit, but there are also non-lytic strategies that viruses use. And we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about them. I will preface this by saying that this is a new area of research. So we don't really know too much about it, but we can kind of split it into two types. We can talk about the idea of autophagy and then membrane enclosed particles. So let's start with autophagy. So for autophagy, auto means self. And phagy comes from this idea of phagocytosis. So when we think about phagocytosis, we say that it is cell eating, pinocytosis is cell drinking. So autophagy is going to be self eating. And what this is, is it's a mechanism of controlled degradation. And so what I mean by that is the cell is digesting and then those pieces will be exocytosed. So earlier when we talked about and we brainstorm some ideas of how naked viruses can get out a student from last year said, well, maybe it acquires, and by it, I mean the virus, so maybe the virus acquires an envelope, and then that envelope fuses with the plasma membrane, and so that virus is now expelled nakedly. And that is actually, essentially, in a nutshell, what happens with autophagy. So we're going to go ahead and kind of draw a model of that. So here's the nucleus. It's kind of hanging out. We're going to go ahead and then draw a lysosome here and then let's draw a naked virus. So again, this is something the cell naturally does. Lysosomes have lots of enzymes to break things up down. Those things can then be expelled out of the cell. So it's just a natural process that the cell goes through. And it's thought that there are viruses that kind of essentially hitch a ride in these lysosomes. So they're going to be um, endocytosed into the lysosome. So they're essentially, we've got a little vesicle there. And then as that lysosome heads towards the plasma membrane, it's going to fuse with the plasma membrane. And when that happens, just like a student last year hypothesized, we now have a naked virus that is expelled. So again, we don't know too many of the details in this area because this is a new area in terms of non-lytic release for viruses, but we do know that this is something that naturally happens in cells. They constantly have lysosomes that are fusing with things, so we've got little vesicles in the lysosomes. We're degrading things and we're expelling them. It's just a natural process of cell digestion and day-to-day -day, um, cell growth that occurs. And so we think that there's a way that viruses can kind of hijack this as well. The other type of new non-lytic release area that we have is this idea of membrane enclosed particles. And so for these membrane enclosed particles, what they are are their vesicles and specifically we call them exosomes, and these vesicles or these exosomes are used for communication. So they're a mechanism of cell-to-cell -cell communication. And again, this is one where we don't fully have all of the details, but I'm going to tell you what we do know. So I'm going to go ahead and draw cell 1 and cell 2. So here's the plasma membrane of cell 1, the plasma membrane of cell 2. Cell 1 is going to go ahead and release an exosome. So these are our signals. <laughs> 
and then that exosome is going to fuse with cell two. And so this is how it would typically work. And then of course we're gonna have cell signaling that occurs. And then I'm gonna very scientifically write something happens. Maybe as a signal to grow, maybe it's a signal that cell one is infected with a virus and cell two should activate antiviral mechanisms, which we'll get to later on in the semester. But either way, this is how it naturally happens. And so what we think can happen in the case of viruses, let me pick another color here so we can distinguish this. So here is cell one, here's its little nucleus, so we kind of have a fried egg looking kind of thing. And after the entire process of replication and assembly, now we have an exosome that is being formed with a virus. So one of the problems, if you will, with this is this is a naked virus that is now enveloped. Well, it uses its capsid for attachment to its host. So how does it get to cell two or the cells around it? And again, one of the hypotheses is that maybe it just uses the environment, um, the natural properties to degrade the envelope. So we know that enveloped viruses aren't as stable as naked viruses. And so maybe that's okay. Maybe it just kind of hangs around for that envelope to degrade. Or maybe in the case of in our bodies, because it's so close, cell two is going to naturally endocytose it because it's going to think that it's an exosome. So those are some of the ideas that are kind of floating around in the fields of virology when it comes to non-lytic release. So again, kind of newer areas, these are gonna develop and we're gonna get more and more information as time goes on. All right, so now we've talked about all of the steps and we kind of have one little thing left to talk about, and that is this idea of maturation. And maturation is a process that takes place after assembly and release. And we say that this is an irreversible action. So once you mature, there is no going back. And some of the things that happen are things like rearrangement or cleavage of viral proteins. So we'll talk about a couple of examples, but the key point about maturation is that it must be done for a virus to be an infectious particle. So for viruses that must undergo maturation, if they do not do this step, they are essentially goners and completely useless. So we are going to talk about three examples of maturation. I'm going to tell you a little bit about flu, and I'm going to tell you about a two-tailed virus that infects an archaea, and then we're going to talk about HIV. So let's go ahead and start with the maturation of flu. So let's remind ourselves of what a typical flu virion looks like. Go ahead and draw our envelope. So it's got two types of glycoproteins. It's got hemagglutins, the HAs, and the neuraminidases. And then it has a segmented genome. So I'm going to go ahead and just draw two in there, even though they technically have more, usually seven to eight or so. So let's go ahead and remind ourselves of what these two proteins do. So the HA is the hemagglutin protein, and this is the receptor. So this is what recognizes sialic acid, if you think back to step one, and then NA is neuraminidase, 
goodness, I normally struggle with spelling, but today it's extra horror bad. So our neuraminidase, the end ends in ace, which tells us it's an enzyme. So it is an enzyme that actually cleaves sialic acid. So we're going to kind of put all those pieces together now. So we've already drawn the entire life cycle. We know that flu undergoes budding. So I'm going to write budding. And let's go ahead and draw some viral progeny here. And you'll notice that as I'm drawing them, I'm not drawing them far away from the host. I'm drawing them stuck on the plasma membrane. And so one of the things that happens is as flu goes through concerted assembly and we get this budding, these virions get stuck at the plasma membrane. And they get stuck at the plasma membrane because we have a ton of sialic acid. So first we have receptors that recognize the sialic acid. So we've got things budding, things recognizing. So they kind of get a little lost and confused and they get stuck. So one of the things that naturally happens is that neuraminidase, and this is why flu has two glycoproteins. So I told you at the beginning of the semester that we would come full circle and I would tell you why. So here it is, here's me telling you why. But this neuraminidase is going to cleave the sialic acid and release the mature virions. So these virions are not mature until the neuraminidase cleaves that sialic acid and those virions are now able to, you know, go ahead and infect other cells and, and cause more damage to other cells. Or in the case of if you're sneezing on people, other people. So this idea of neuraminidase cleaving sialic acid and these virions getting stuck is actually one of the ways that we treat influenza. So you've probably heard of the drug Tamiflu. And we'll circle back to Tamiflu when we talk about antivirals. But I'll give you a little bit of sneak peek for this. Tamiflu actually blocks neuraminidase. And so because neuraminidase can't function, um, it's going to go ahead and stop the life cycle. And so another thing that I will kind of preview for you as we move forward is vaccines. So typically for flu vaccines, they tend to be against the hemagglutin. The neuraminidase is pretty sparse on the envelope compared to the hemagglutin glycoprotein. And the other thing that we have learned over years of studying flu is that our neuraminidase doesn't mutate as often as our hemagglutin does. And so that's why typically our vaccines are going to be against hemagglutin. Okay, so that's our first example is flu. Our second example that we're going to talk about is HIV. So when we drew HIV and we drew its concerted assembly and exit, we kind of cheated a little bit. We actually kind of skipped the maturation step. So for HIV, when HIV is released, it's actually released and it looks like our micrograph on the left. So I'm going to label this pre-maturation and I'm going to label this post maturation. So if we take a look at the micrograph from our textbook on the left here, we see that this is our envelope. Here on the inside is our capsid, but our capsid looks nothing like what we typically draw because it typically should have a club-shaped capsid. So the way that HIV budding actually works is, let's go ahead and draw, this will be the inside of the cell, and then this will be the outside. So we drew most of it correct. So we're going to have our glycoproteins 
that have gone through the endomembrane system that are targeted to our plasma membrane. We're going to have capsid proteins that start to assemble pseudodiploid genome, our reverse transcriptase, our integrase, and all of our other proteins and pieces that need to come with it. Well, we skipped one step when we drew this, and the step that we skipped, oh, that's too big, is the maturation step. So when HIV is released or it buds off of the cell, it actually looks something like this. And these little random circles on the inside are the reverse transcriptase um, enzymes, the integrase, and some proteases and other things that are packaged. Well, this outer part right here is the gag protein. And the gag protein is actually a couple of proteins that are in one polypeptide. We've already mentioned gag protein today. It's part of the, one of the proteins that recognizes that pseudodiploid and it's thought that it plays a role in um, packaging and assembly to make sure we package the correct nucleic acid. And one of the things that happens after the virion is released is there's a protease that processes that gag protein, and when this happens, one of the proteins that is made up of, for the, or one of the proteins that um, is part of that gag polypeptide is the capsid protein. And so when we have that protease that processes the gag, so it's chopped up, what happens is it results in a morphological change. And what I mean by that is that's where we actually get our wonky looking capsid. So our club shaped capsid. And again, that is shown in the micrographs on the right. So here is again, pre-maturation. We've got what looks like to be a circular capsid. So our gag protein is right here. That gets processed by the protease. And now that capsid protein, because of that protease processing is released and we can have a morphological and conformational change that results in the capsid that we would typically think of for HIV. So again, a really cool post-maturation structure compared to pre-maturation for HIV. All right, the very last example that we're gonna talk about is actually an archaeovirus, and one that we don't really talk about a lot because we mostly focus on eukaryotic viruses. And so we're gonna talk about this two-tailed virus. And this two-tailed virus infects archaea. And the archaea that it infects is Acidianus. And so oftentimes this virus is called Acidianus two-tailed virus. Um, and so that's what we will refer to it. And this is a really cool virus. It was found in an acid hot spring in Italy, and the temperature that it was found in, 93 degrees Celsius, you know, no big deal, not hot at all. But the thing that makes this so freaking cool is its structure. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in here on this micrograph. So hopefully in this micrograph, you can see that the structure kind of looks like a lemon shaped virus. And it's got these two tails that come out of what the tips of the lemon structure would be, which as you can guess is where the name comes from. And so probably the coolest thing about this virus is that the tails can grow. And I'm going to put grow in um, quotations here, because grow is kind of used loosey-goosey here, but these tails can grow in the absence of the host. And this is really neat because this is the first example of 
extracellular assembly. And so one of the things that scientists did, what, and this is the picture B here, so we're going to talk about what's going on here. But one of the things that scientists did was when they first isolated They saw A, which means that they saw a lemon shape with tails. So when they first discovered this virus in that acid hot spring in Italy, this is what they saw. This is what it looked like underneath a micrograph. We had a nice lemon shape with tails. So the next thing that a first scientist did was they grew it in the lab. Right, so we find something, we want to figure out um, how do we grow it in the lab, and then we want to study it. And so these scientists grew it in lab, and B is what they saw. And so when they released it, or when they grew it in lab, and the host cells in culture released the particles, what they saw was no tails. Now, I will preface this by saying that when they did this in the lab, this was done at 75 degrees Celsius. So lower than the temperature that was, um, that the virus was originally isolated at. And what they saw was it took about one week for the tails to grow in the absence of the host. And again, this was at 75 degrees Celsius. And these pictures, I'm going to go ahead and zoom in. So these were taken over time. So here is what the virus looked like when it was first released from the host. So it's got that lemon structure. You can kind of see here at the tips where those tails are going to form. And then these were taken over time. And then here is at the end of two weeks. So, or at the end of one week, I apologize. So here at the end of one week, this virus looks like what the original virus that they isolated looked like. And so they repeated this at 85 to 90 degrees Celsius. And they found that this happens in one hour. So it happens much slower at a lower temperature, at a higher temperature, closer to that of what the host is normally found at, it happens in an hour. But either way, this is a really cool example of maturation, particularly as we don't always talk about archaeal viruses in this class. All right, so now that we have covered everything in this topic, we've kind of talked about a lot of pieces and they're spread out over two lectures or two videos. And so what I want you all to do is to go ahead and pause the video and I want you to do two things. I want you to compare and contrast our sequential versus concerted assembly. And the second compare and contrast that we're going to do is naked versus envelope virus released. So again, I'm going to encourage you to pause the video here and to make a compare contrast table for both of these. And then we'll come back together and we will make the table. All right, so hopefully you have taken some time to make your compare and contrast tables for your sequential versus concerted assembly and for naked versus enveloped viruses for release. So we're going to go ahead and build a table together. So again, these are thoughts and ideas that I have pulled from our two lectures that we have had and kind of trying to summarize them all on one page. So please bear with me. I made a total noob mistake as I was filming this lecture and rather than pause the recording so I could pull my thoughts together for this. I accidentally hit end recording. So we're going to try to do something new with the program that I'm using and splice this video together with the previous one. So hopefully there'll still only be two parts. If I can't figure it out, then I'll just put the short little segment up alone. So in the future, when you are watching this, keep your fingers crossed. Hopefully Dr. Hubbs was able to figure out how to splice these two videos together. But I digress. Let's go ahead and start with our sequential versus concerted assembly. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to write sequential on one side. We'll do our concerted and then we'll do both. 
So I'm actually going to start with what is in common for both first because that is going to be the shortest list and hopefully in your list for your compare and contrast table underneath both you have the idea of making subassemblies. So when we first introduced in day one of this topic the idea of sequential versus concerted assemblies we said one of the things that both do is they make subassemblies and so that refers to making the pieces. So in all types of assembly we make the pieces first and we put them together and the only difference between how we put them together is that separation of sequential versus concerted. The other thing that both have in common is that they both include those signal sequences for proteins And so what I mean by that is whether you are undergoing sequential or concerted assembly, the proteins, whether they're capsid proteins or glycoproteins, they are going to have to make it to the correct location to be assembled. And so all of them are going to have signal sequences and they'll go through some version of either the endomembrane system or the non-secretory pathway, depending on where their destination is. And the other thing that we talked about dealt with packaging and for packaging we talked about the idea of signals and viral proteins so there are specific signals in terms of sequences that are found in the RNA and the DNA of viral nucleic acids compared to host nucleic acids. There are viral proteins that play a role in helping us make sure that the genetic information makes it to the correct capsid. So now we're going to kind of bounce back and forth between sequential and concerted. So the main differential here is for sequential, this is very much so a step by step. So kind of like an assembly line, we make the pieces and when we assemble the pieces, we do it one at a time. So maybe we do the capsid first, then we do the glycoproteins. Um, maybe we have tail fibers that have to go on, but either way, it's a step by step. Step one has to happen before step two, before step three, so on and so forth. Whereas concerted is the idea that it's more or less at the same time. So we make all the pieces and all the pieces kind of magically come together essentially. First, it's not magic at all. It's all based on signaling and chemistry, but it, it kind of seems like magic. So next what we're going to do is we're going to focus mostly on examples because again in this class, we have been using model viruses to talk about everything. So let's go ahead and write our examples for both of these. So the first example that we talked about for sequential was polio. And this was our example of a virus that does sequential assembly in the cytoplasm. And the next one that we talked about was herpes virus, which completes in the nucleus. We also mentioned adenovirus. Adenovirus also assembles in the nucleus. So today we actually drew that. Um, and both of these actually make a procapsid. So they um, require a scaffolding protein to begin to build the capsid and then the capsid matures into a mature nucleocapsid in the case of herpes and then a mature capsid in the case of adenovirus. And again, this is because there are larger viruses. Now some of the viruses that we didn't talk about that are probably not in your compare and contrast table but I'm going to add them here because they're viruses that we have been referring to all semester are our polyoma viruses. So we have talked about how those copy their genetic information. Um, one thing that we didn't mention is that polyoma viruses like our adenoviruses actually have a viral protein. And so um, or a viroporin, so they do have a viral protein, but they have viroporin specifically. So when we talk about release, we'll actually throw that example in there as well. But polyomaviruses are another great example of sequential assembly, as are 
our parvoviruses. For our concerted assembly, we talked about how these also do budding. So I'm actually going to add one more bullet point up here and add in budding. So that idea of release at the plasma membrane, getting your envelope from the plasma membrane is called blood budding. We talked about flu and HIV and other things that we can add to this are our toga viruses, our viruses, and then our paramyxo viruses, and then rhabdoviridae. So again, we didn't talk about toga, philo, paramyxo, and rhabdoviridae, but we have been talking about those model viruses throughout the entire semester. So I wanted to make sure that we threw that in here and we kind of talked about how even though we only drew flu and HIV, you can actually take your knowledge of how flu and HIV assembly happens and use that and apply it to these other four groups of viruses. And again, I, can't, I challenge you to do this. Um, I think that all of you at this point in the semester are able to draw the entire life cycle. And that is including assembly. And then we will actually write these in our next compare and contrast table so you can kind of see where those fall as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and now make our second compare contrast table and talk about our naked versus our enveloped virus release. So I'm gonna do this one a little bit differently. I'm gonna go ahead and have naked viruses and then enveloped viruses. I'm gonna move all of this over a little bit to give myself more room. So for our naked viruses, we can go ahead and we're going to start with those. And we said that these are usually lytic release. And um, this is can be done through a couple of different means. So through apoptosis, which we didn't get into the details of that in this lecture, but we will talk more about the signaling that viruses um change in a cell to both inhibit apoptosis, but then also induce apoptosis when it comes to the lytic release. So again, it's a timing thing, so we'll talk about that. And the main mechanism that we talked about today was viroporins. And the example that we talked about was adenovirus, and so that was that adenovirus death protein that we drew as a knife where it chops up all of the different membranes, so both the nucleus to get out of the nucleus and then the plasma membrane to get out of the cell. And then another example that I mentioned on the previous page was polyoma viruses. And polyoma viruses use a viroporin called VP4. And then the other thing that we said that can happen, and this was that new area of release, was the idea of non-lytic release. And for non-lytic release, we kind of had two mechanisms for non-lytic release that we talked about. We talked about autophagy and then membrane vesicles, or those membrane-enclosed particles and how those are typically used for communication, but viruses hijack them to be released in a non-lytic matter. Now for enveloped viruses, we're actually gonna split this into two. And the reason for that is there's different ways that enveloped viruses can acquire their envelope. And they can acquire their envelope by doing exocytosis at the plasma membrane. So this idea of budding, 
And again, when this happens, our membrane or our envelope comes from the plasma membrane. And we're going to list the examples. So the two that we have focused on have been flu and HIV, your filoviridae also fall underneath this category, your paramyxo viruses fall underneath this category, your toga viruses, and then rhabdoviridae as well will fall underneath this category. We also talked about an example of viruses that do, um, that I should say acquire their membrane from internal structures. And so that could be the nucleus, the ER, or the Golgi. Here we only really talked about one example, and the example that we talked about was herpes. So herpes virus is a really great model virus for how this happens. And the other example that I'm going to provide for you in terms of which virus falls underneath this category, but I'm going to have you do more research on it because it'll help you with your final exam for this class, and that is coronaviruses. So we've kind of mentioned and interweaved coronaviruses throughout the semester as best as we can, especially given the current outbreak. So coronaviruses are viruses that actually acquire their membrane from internal structures. And so what that means is that when they do exocytosis at the plasma membrane, they don't do budding, but they end up with that double membrane like herpes does, and you get membrane fusion that happens at the plasma membrane and then they're released into the extracellular space. Now, one of the things that I will challenge you to think about is that herpes virus is a double-stranded DNA virus. And so that means that it's going to assemble in the nucleus because that's where the DNA viruses go. And we talked about its um, sequential assembly making a procapsid. And then it releases from the nucleus and goes through the endomembrane system. But contrast that with coronaviruses, which have a positive sense RNA genome, and those replicate in the cytoplasm. So they're still going to use the endomembrane system, but I challenge you to think about which pieces of the endomembrane system a coronavirus will use versus which ones it kind of just glosses over and it doesn't need because it's different in terms of where it not only synthesizes its nucleic acid, but where it also assembles. So I'm going to leave you with that kind of key piece of information and key question that, again, that will help you with your final take-home exam for this class. So we have officially wrapped up topic 10, which was the idea of assembly, exit, and maturation. And for our next lecture, our next video, we're going to talk about topic 11, which is the infected cell. So believe it or not, we have finally completed talking about the entire life cycle of a virus. It seems like it took forever. It took a great majority of the semester. And now we're going to move into some big picture things. So we're going to talk about what's happening to the host. What are some of the um, cell signaling pathways that are affected? And so this is one of my favorite topics. I hope that you all are looking forward to it. And fingers crossed that splicing this video works. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. I'm going to go ahead and make some magical editing hopefully occur, and I will catch you in the next lecture. Have a great one. Bye, everyone.